Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 396 with Jinya Zhang, who is an absolutely incredible person I met over at THU. This is the first of our THU podcasts that I've done. I've done several of them that I've recorded over there. Uh, and I recorded uh, great videos, so definitely go check these out uh, in uh, in video form on our YouTube page, which we'll know about in a second. Uh, but Jinga is a incredible person. Uh, she has a great story, uh, a really amazing origin story, uh, and she's an incredible photographer. She does fine art photography. Uh, she's done photography for, for all the biggest brands and fashion magazines, uh, and a just absolutely really cool cool person. And I got to spend a lot of time with her after this podcast. Guess. And I got to tell you, she's a really cool cat, uh, a lot of fun to be with, and uh, it was really a lot of fun to do this with her. So, but Kristen, what did you think of Jinya? <laughs> yeah, she is just an amazing woman. She kind of takes us through her photography career um, and just how she got to where she was today um, from winning like the bronze uh, for the air rifle shooting at the Commonwealth Games right. um, to being on Forbes 30 Under 30. Um, she's just done so much at a young age. Um, and like you said, she's worked with some of the top brands, um, Lancome, Mercedes-Benz, Canon, Sony, Vogue, China, and Japan. So that's just to name a few as well. Um, but she kind of takes her passion for it's, it's man, manga. Mm -hmm. I can't. <laughs> I can say it right. Um, and that's kind of really influenced her uh, photographic style and kind of as well as the technique she uses for a, her um, aesthetic. So it kind of, she says the camera is her paintbrush. Um, and I also just kind of love how she talks about what makes a good model. She kind of goes into that and how they study the kind of styles that she likes and it's really helpful for her um and then she you guys go a little bit into the ai algorithms at the end and how they are starting to copy styles and all that so it's just a very interesting podcast but absolutely yeah. absolutely and she and we'll, we'll on the podcast page itself we'll have links to her instagram which you should see because her photography it's amazing it looks like mm. it's uh, illustration and it's completely in camera photography uh, and really cool stuff. So go definitely go check it out. Uh, uh, really cool. Okay, we have a couple of announcements. In fact, we have a special guest today to tell us about. Uh, just, Lon just got back from Base Camp. Tell us what's going on, or what happened at Base Camp a little bit, and a little bit about V-Ray 6 for SketchUp and Rhino. Yeah, when when you call it base camp, it sounds, you know, like I was doing some kind of, you know, I was in Nepal or, <laughs> or something. This was SketchUp base camp, yes. uh, which is, you know, it's a little bit different than mountain climbing. <laughs> but uh, while you were on the other part, you know, other side of the globe, I was in Vancouver yeah. um, for the second time this year, which is a bit of a strange circumstance <laughs> for me. But it was nice to be back up there and uh, watching the seaplanes come in and out. Uh, we were at uh, SketchUp Base Camp, which happens every other year. Um, this was the first time it had come back uh, in a few years because of the, the pandemic and the last time it was in Palm Springs. So um, that was, uh, it was a great event. We had, uh, uh, we had our team there showcasing um, all the latest of, of what's happening in V-Ray for SketchUp. And uh, in fact, V-Ray for SketchUp V-Ray 6 for SketchUp and for Rhino have just dropped. So they're available now. A um, couple of really cool things that, that have happened there. Um, there's a new tool called Enmesh that's made it into all of our V-Ray 6 uh, offerings. It's kind of like taking a 3D pattern geometry and using it like a 2D texture. So you can create like knitted fabrics or chain mail or all kinds of stuff. So that's in there. Um, procedural clouds are in there as well. And that's uh, from our friends and, and colleagues at uh, uh, Enscape, they had uh, we've introduced procedural clouds from some of their tech. Um, that's become a huge hit. One of the great things about it in V-Ray is it works with volumetrics, so you can create um, God rays, sunbeams, or crepuscular rays. For all of you, you know, want to know the scientific term, we'll drop that in there. <laughs> crepuscular rays. Impress your friends with that knowledge. And then also we've been working closely with the team at Enscape to bring uh, all of the Enscape uh, design information and make it renderable in V-Ray. So now you can be working in uh, Enscape for, for SketchUp or Enscape for Rhino, and that will immediately now render with V-Ray, which is awesome. So you get sort of a one-to-one -one translation from what was real-time into uh, in, in Enscape into V-Ray, and now, 
with that bridge, we call it, uh, you know, we're sort of calling it the, this, this bridge, um, you can take it even further. So you can manipulate your V-ray materials and your, you get full global illumination and all the ray tracing goodness that you want. And so this is kind of really one of the first times where, you know, designers can be working on their design and then transfer it over to either their internal viz, viz teams or um, maybe an outsourced viz partner and not lose any data in the process. So, it, you know, I liken it to you don't have to shake the Etch-a-Sketch before you give it to the next person. You can start, you know, right where you're where you left off. So that's pretty exciting news from us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really cool to find, you know, to, to be able to work with our with our colleagues at, N, uh, at Enscape and be able to <laughs> to literally bridge the connection between the two of our, our products and be able to take all the benefits of, uh, of Enscape and bring them right into V-Ray uh, and allow them to render. And so that bridge is really cool. So SketchUp, Enscape, and V-Ray all together. Happy yeah. little family. And, and I- <laughs> And I should mention, this is just the start, right? right. This is sort of one, one way. We're working on all kinds of other things to make it uh, you know, go opposite direction in the future. And um, yeah, exciting times. Absolutely. So yeah, go, go, guys, go check it out. V-Ray 6 for SketchUp and Rhino is officially out with a lot of cool new stuff. And of course, V-Ray 6 for Max has been out for, uh, for a while, and so is Maya. Uh, and more products will be dropping as we and, go. And C4D is out too. C4D yeah. is also out. So yeah, that's excellent. Yep. Uh, so that's great. All right, Kristen, we have a couple of announcements going on, a couple of events. What's going on? Yeah, so you can find these out at chaos.com slash events. Uh, the first one coming up will be on October 19th, and that is Chaos Day in Paris. This will be a live in-person event, so you can join Chaos at Cyclone, and it will be from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. that day. Again, find more about this on chaos.com slash events. And then the other three, I think the next two are online. So the other one is actually October 19th as well, and that is the Chaos Campus Live Show, Episode 8. Uh, the one following that is October 26, and this will be a free webinar, and you can watch and learn more about V-Ray 6 for Cinema 4D. And the one right after that, it will be starting November. It's November 3rd through 5th, and this will be SketchUp um, at China 3D Design Summit in Beijing. So you can join Chaos and Enscape there. But Perfect. Lots of fun. Perfect. <laughs> and you can find all this again at chaos.com slash events. Again, that is chaos.com slash events. Uh, and oh, happy to see that. Now, if people want to know more about the podcast, Kristen, where can they go? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage podcast or chaos.com slash CG Garage. And if you'd like to watch us, go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Yes, and absolutely. You guys should go check these out. All the THU ones I recorded on video. I have a new a new system of doing all these podcasts so we can check out the new videos. Uh, go to chaos.com slash TV to check out uh, to check these out in video because, uh, you know, it'd be great to see, you know, to actually see the interview happen live. If you want to watch it in audio, I'm not going to hold you accountable to that. But <laughs> anyway, if you guys have uh, any comments or ideas for the podcast don't forget you can always email us labs at chaos.com we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to hear your suggestions but for now please enjoy episode number 396 with jing yak zang welcome to another cg garage where the chaos group talks you'll know it's over when the last bucket drops we're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range, we know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. Do you want an extremely long version? Or? Yeah, we got an hour to hang out. So, so tell me, okay, so where, where, where did it come from? Like, what, what inspired you to do the things you're doing right now? Like, okay. what's, the, what's the seed that started this? Okay, is it rolling? Or yeah, we... yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is it that started this? Uh, so, um, I grew up and I really liked anime a lot. Uh, growing up, I, uh-huh. I spent a lot of time alone as a child, so I feel like I modeled my world imperfectly mm-hmm. uh, a lot on just shonen anime I grew up watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, I liked Gundam a lot uh-huh. at that time. So I just always t- was uh, visually and I guess philosophically kind of interested in, in the themes that goes on in these in this kind of stuff. And I hang out a lot in like IRC channels with like anime and, and uh, um, artists who were drawing like fan art, things like that. Yeah. And I played in like a Japanese rock cover band. So just like the, the whole breadth of 
you know, just people being into anime and manga things. Right. And uh, kind of started off on, you know, DeviantArt, like tail ends of Cision, it was like GFX artists, like all the early art platforms I was on it. Mm -hmm. So posting like for my friends, managing their work. This was, this was before I started photography on my own. Okay. And a couple of my friends became uh, relatively popular on those platforms. So I started managing their work and just being really involved in like seeing a little bit of the process of, you know, concept art and illustration. And we would handle like commissions and, you know, Q&A uh, panels for like Imagine FX and things like that. Right. So I think a lot of my early art training came from looking at manga and then looking at my artist friend's work that just informed me on what I like and don't like about an image, you know, in terms of just kind of color training and composition training through try and error and, and just figuring out preferences and forming kind of a foundation and visual language and aesthetic approach. Right. Yeah, so this is a little bit like that. Yeah. So what, where, around what time was this? This was when I was around 14 years old. Uh -huh. So I did these like managing stuff for four to five years. Okay. Yeah. So at the time I was on the national team in Singapore as a national athlete in air rifle. So I represented oh. Singapore in like the Commonwealth Games, um, World Cup. I broke a record at the Commonwealth Shooting Championships against an Olympic contender. So nice. I was very proud of that. I was only 16. And uh, because of that, I took time off from school a lot. And so okay. I think that gave me free time to just spend online and make friends that's outside of the typical uh, middle school, high school, social circle. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I'm very interested in air rifle. I think there's going to be some interest. But like air rifle is like, it's so hard to get that precision because uh -huh. it's so light. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Did you do the short distance? One? Ten meters. Ten yes. Me oh, and gosh. you have a target card that's like this big. Yeah. Right. And the ten is, or the size of a period, like we like to say at the end of a newspaper article. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And you have to weigh the weighted vests to. Uh, uh, our shooting jacket. Yeah. yeah it's extremely heavy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an incredible, uh, but yeah, that's so interesting. That's a, I've always been fascinated by that. By that. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right. So how this 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 sort of was the, the 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 stimulus, right? The spark before the explosion of what you were trying to do creatively, right? The I idea suppose. of of tr following the you know following art and understanding art and doing yeah. that. Yeah, I think just composition. just being very interested in it and just really wanting to be part of it, right? And right because of my competitive nature, at the same time, I didn't really want to be an artist because I feel like my friends were so talented and I'm, I'm 10 years behind them, even if I were talented. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to constantly feel like I had to play catch up. So I, I was interested in finding something different that I could do. Right. And right around when I was 18, that was when uh, Ken and uh, Nikon first introduced their entry-level DSLRs that were quite right. affordable. Right. So I just bought one of them for, for myself my birthday with my award money from doing air rifle shooting. And what, what, which one it. was it? I bought the 350D. I'm not sure what it was called in the, in the US, but it was one of the first ones. It was like one of the first Rebel yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the first Rebel one. Probably. Yeah. I had that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. what I used. Yeah, okay. So it was like your introduction to digital photography, right? Because yeah. The, yeah. yeah, because before then, I guess the 5D was available, but that was expensive, yes, right? Yes, yes, much, yeah. much more inaccessible. Right, to, and it's an APC lens, and so, or, or yeah, back, yeah, yeah, we buy like a Rebel kit. It's right. so yeah. much more affordable compared. So to what? So what was that experience holding that camera? And so, what did you start to look at when you looked through those lenses? Uh, I think in the beginning, um, it's kind of a funny story uh, because I was spending so much time on DeviantArt, right? And right. Obviously, we were making the front page a lot with my friend's work, and I'm always looking at it. And I just thought, um, I didn't. I saw some photographers who posted work that were maybe of a single scene or environment or like a merry-go-round from like ten different angles with ten different types of like Instagram sepia filtering, and I just sure. felt like that's not creatively interesting and is almost a little bit out of spite that I thought I think I can make a more interesting image right. you know and because DeviantArt was where we lived right I I thought it would be fun to create images that fuse a little bit painterly like I, I, I would love the idea if someone was browsing through DeviantArt and they stopped on my work and thought is this a photo or a painting right so I really started off from from something like that it wasn't like an 
like now I could say I have more like intentional uh, references in like, okay, I'm inspired by the pre-Raphaelite here or inspired by uh, a specific mangaka or illustrator. But back then it was just among the masses of that, I just wanted to be able to pose that question. I thought that would be right. interesting. Yeah. So in the beginning, I was just making pictures that could look, you know, and, and provoke that kind of question. Right. And, and we often, I often did get that. And I think that's what made it a little bit interesting for my early followers too. But the thing about photography, you know, there's several parts of it, right? Because there's stuff you can do behind the lens and there's mm -hmm. stuff you can do in front of the lens yeah. as well. So what were the things you were doing in front and behind that were different from, from other photography? <laughs> uh, I think even though I was, I was a digital photographer, well, I still am a digital photographer, I, even compared to many of my peers, what I hear from people in production is I really do like to get a lot of pictures, uh, a lot of my shoot elements in camera. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a little bit selfish and a little bit lazy because to me, I just feel like I, I personally want the experience of creating something that's a little bit magical. And, right. you know, like Greg Crutzen likes to say, like willing something into existence, you know, that's right. what photography is. And, and I think I definitely feel that very strongly. So if it's going to look magical in, you know, uh, in the final result, like I, I like to see that magic in person. I don't like to compose it too much. No. And, and I have nothing against it. I have like, you know, I have so many friends in VFX and so many friends who do, uh, you know, like fantasy, like com composite work. Mm -hmm. And we obviously do some of that in like advertising and sure. selectively in some other work, right? It's, to me, it's like a different medium. But like purely on general photography, I really like to capture as much as I can in camera. Sure. And apparently it's not super common. <laughs> okay. Yeah, apparently it's not super common. And um, behind the camera, I think uh, I have a strong sense for colors. Like, like I said, like just from early days, right. maybe building up a preference. And I'm always told like my color grading, like you don't really have a color grading as a line item in production for photography, you know, in video, of course, in film is a sure. thing. But uh, in photography is definitely something I get hired for sometimes, just, just right. sense of color and the treatment from a pre-shot versus the final. Yeah, so I think that's something I do a, a bit uniquely uh, different for myself. Right, Yeah. right, right, right. Now, I know you mentioned you know, the, the images that you saw were not necessarily compelling to what you're doing when you f first saw them, and that's why you decided to, to take photographs, because you can make more interesting photos, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, the interesting photos, what's interesting, like, what makes an, a photo interesting? Is there some kind of story that you're trying to tell, and what, how do you figure out what that story is? In, well, in the very beginning, for me, what made it interesting, for example, was definitely just, like I said, making someone stop and think, is this a photo or is this an illustration or a painting? Uh, right. Right. So, so that, I mean, now you have a lot more fantasy photography sure. as a genre with hobbies or professionals or fine art work. But back then it was, uh, I think in my particular style, it was relatively still quite uncommon. Right. Yeah. And as, as time evolves, I think, if I see people doing more of a certain thing that I have been doing, I definitely try to find something that I feel like is less common. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's just, maybe it's just me having ADD and I just like to keep things a little bit more interesting and varied. Yeah, right. just try to go for that. Okay, when I can. so how, how did, those, how did those, those early days in photography and your experimentation and you trying to do things, mm. how did that uh, you know, evolve into a career? Like that, that journey was the... It's hard. There's a lot of people who pick up photography, but they don't always find a way to make, be good enough to make it into a career. Right. I think I was definitely really, really lucky in terms of, you know, right work at the right time. Okay. I, I was one of the few photographers that was, you know, posting regularly or making something different on DeviantArt at the time. So mm -hmm. I was really fortunate that I, it definitely gave me a lot of visibility. Mm -hmm. I, I got my first commercial job, like within a year after studying photography, I, I started shooting for Harper's Bazaar Singapore. Uh, I shot for Mercedes-Benz, uh, Taiwan. So even regionally, I had campaigns that came in with my photo that showed up as references in people's decks. So it, it just 
it kind of gives you confidence to right. execute the work. And uh, back in the early days, I think there's just, uh, there's just, and, uh, also when you were younger, right, you just move a lot faster. So sure. I think that, like at the rate I created and was able to improve it early on was just so much higher than now. Now it just always feels like a struggle. <laughs> you sure. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was just constantly creating stuff, really. Comforting now, sometimes I'm just like a little bit envious, a little bit like upset at myself, you know, things like that. It's just definitely this, the spirit, like I try to re remember how that was like, mm -hmm. but it's obviously it's harder when you, when you know more and you see more. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's a sort of an amazing, uh, amazing journey to go from that and so, sort of saying it's like, oh, I'm just going to just make, 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 and then put it yeah. out there. Now, you had DeviantArt, right? And yeah. that, was, that was a good way to, to get your, your stuff referenced. And, and, you know, it's really like when, when you're younger, you really, uh, in Chinese, there's, there's this saying like, um, 出生牛的不怕虎 is like, like young calf is not afraid of a tiger. Like you, you just try things, you don't think of it being difficult, right? Like right. within that year, I, I, I did a, my first solo exhibition, uh -huh. you know, wow. and I exhibited at the Ass House, which is one of the more premier national art galleries in right. Singapore. It was like a, a small location at the Ass House, but, mm -hmm. it, and I did my first photo book and never questioned twice. You know, I, I knew people who were in CG, uh, one of the Singaporean studios, Imaginary Friends studios, and, right. um, they, they published their own art book. So I just asked them like, hey, where can I get this printed? And then they introduced me to the printing company. Sure. And you, know, you just go through this entire process and you never think it's difficult. And I had adults look at me like, oh, I don't know how you can do a photo book. And I mean, I look back now and I'm like, yeah, I'm ashamed of like 99% of the photos in that book. But right. back then you just like, oh, these are my best work and I have followers who like it. Like, let's make something that they will like. You know, let's put out a book and an exhibition. And, uh, at that time, people still enjoyed it, and and that you know just obviously now in retrospect, you look back, it's like oh, it's great marketing and branding exercises, you know, sure. places me well. Like I did both gallery stuff and I did prestige magazine and client work, and and you just try to keep going, yeah. But but now it's like doing a book is <laughs> it's insanely difficult. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. It's harder to be selective, right? Yes, and you're just constantly like, well, is people gonna say it sucks or I don't wanna let down my publisher or... <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I think it's interesting. I think it's fascinating that you, you're able to do that at that age, but I mean, you obviously have grown very quickly, right? You've done a lot of amazing things. You live in the United States now? I live in the U.S. now, yes. Okay. Yeah. So how, how, how was that journey? Why did you come over here? What did you feel was, or to the United States, we're in Portugal. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so I started shooting for Hubs Bazaar and yeah, uh, Mercedes-Benz, that was my first year. And within the first two, three years, I did like a campaign for Canon and I started shooting for Lancome. So like, like, I've shot for most of the high-end brands. You know, I did a, right. like Mont Blanc uh, editorial, which was regional, and uh, yeah, shot celebrities. So that was in my early twenties, and uh, at one point, you just feel like, as an artist, obviously, I want to grow, and I'm curious about what's out there. Sure. And as with many many sports, um, I had you know, some trauma from my time doing air rifle. That's, that's the reason I quit actually as a profession. And that's part of the reason why I was very interested in photography because I had so much, I felt like I had so much control over my own life uh, in comparison to when you are tied to a team and whether you go to a tournament or not doesn't always depend on your result. It depends on what someone says, right. yeah, things like that. Like for this, I'm like, wow, I can fire a client. I can fire my team. I, I can fire myself from a project. Like any right. of these is possible when, when I'm, you know, the person who gets to say. So um, it, it kind of reached a point of saturation with, you know, just work-wise, I wanted to grow, like experience more and see more of the world. I did enjoy traveling and just in terms of, you know, just depression, mental health, I, I just felt like I had such a hard time in Singapore and I just felt like I physically needed to be away. Right. So I, I wasn't getting triggered or getting like more difficulties. And, and so I decided to come to the US. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that's I, I, that's interesting. I mean, I'm you know I'm sorry you had a, 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 a an experience that was traumatic, but I'm glad you were able to make that journey. So that was really nice. yeah. <laughs> yeah everything happens for a reason, and you know you just the best you can do is try to be positive. 
about that right. too, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I sort of go a little aside here, but like, take us through the process of what is the what is the creative process of creating a, a picture, right? Of the pic, mm -hmm. like, the, let's say you're going to do a, uh, a picture of for Mont Blanc, right? Mm -hmm. Is there when you're given that that are you given that assignment? Are you given some art direction before, and you have to do execute mm -hmm. it, or do you sort of create the art direction in mm -hmm. front of the lens that you're trying to create? For for bigger clients, most of the time. Uh, there is already a creative director or art director tied to the project. Okay. And they have come up with a concept and visual, and that's when they go look for a photographer that's suitable for this project. Okay. So usually I'm here just to kind of uh, reflect back to them some ideas to expand on it and okay. then execute what is there. Sure. Uh, for my personal projects, that is when I do come up from zero and, and you come up with the whole concept and execution and production, post-production and all that right. stuff. So how do how for your personal project and how would how would you come up with those ideas? What are the things that inspire you for those images and stuff? Uh, Give us an example of a of an image that you've done, and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll post it so people can have a reference of what they're talking about. If that's okay. Uh, yeah, well, put me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of what, what would be a good example. Like, should, should we pick a safe for work or not safe for work? <laughs> Either one. That doesn't matter. Um, uh, so I did a series of work uh, a few years ago called the Motherland Chronicles, and I did it in collaboration with uh, one of my artist friends I've known for many years, Tobias Kwan. And we just tried to produce something weekly. So it was just a weekly project, and we had okay. a loose, loose theme of, you know, just uh, slightly Western painterly inspired, like some Russian motives. And uh, I just tried to do a lot of the things that I did not get to do commercially, editorially. Okay. Yeah. So, so at that time, um, the beginning build of the project was just really to meet the once a week uh, goal and then slowly build up a library of costumes and props that I could use. Okay. And it was really towards the back that I think there was a clearer, definitive style and visual language. Right. And for example, I was referencing a lot of you know, classical painters and pre-Raphaelite artists, and mixing that a little bit with uh, manga artists uh, who reference that time period as well uh -huh. to put together like motifs. And sometimes it could be as simple as like, uh, for example, in 90s uh, anime, you have these uh, fantasy elfish characters and they always have a simple circlet. And obviously you see that in you know, a lot of rings, right? But mm -hmm. it, the way they do it in anime manga is a slightly different style or a different approach. And right. I just kind of, sometimes I view it as simply as that. I just start from that, like what would go well on a circle. And then mm -hmm. maybe if it's an elf-like or nymph-like character, then we go for like a full uh, platinum blonde hair kind of model with like pale white lashes. And, and it just like, you, you start adding elements to that to like really start from just a very small, simple catalyst. Yep. Yeah. And, and then you flesh out the image. Um, I was shooting a lot of that in my own apartment. So I would build, do the set design. Or I would just go to the corner store and buy all their flowers on a Sunday morning and, and then start building it in, in my apartment. Wow. So it, it was a little bit very ad hoc and like improvised. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a little bit of how it goes. And we would take maybe an entire day to make one or two image. So it's really just, okay, I want to nail this particular concept and have the best uh, like even at that point I was still thinking like I would love for one photo shoot to only have one image that comes out of it so it feels iconic and people still have the question of, is this a painting or is this a photo right? right and it doesn't feel like a series of photos because you only ever see one image from this shoot oh, and, and the value yeah, of that yeah, yeah. leaves the impact like it is a painting and obviously there are painters who paint a series from something too right so yes. I have grew to expand myself yeah. and I hopefully give myself the room to do more but I always think uh, that that leaves something uh, iconic and interesting for people right. when you do that so that was a very intentional thing I was doing for my work, yeah. personal work. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. having seen some of your style and stuff that you've done, I definitely noticed you, uh, you tend to favor a very high contrast in terms of how mm -hmm. things look. Do you think no, that yeah. is, uh, uh, that comes from that inspiration from manga, which is also high contrast in a lot of ways? <laughs> I have 
never thought about that, but that's a very interesting point. Because you know, as as an as a viewer, I enjoy picture with low contrast, uh, sure. very crushed blacks, or you know, yeah. highlights and things yeah. like that. But when it comes to my own work, I could start there, and then eventually, as I show the work, I just add more and more contrast. Right, it's right. true. Yeah, uh, I think yeah, it's just readability. Uh, I do enjoy having like a just a simple read. You know, like from a thumbnail, you can just see what it is without having to open it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that okay. There's, there's that. I was going to get into that as well because you have very iconic images that, that, that come that you, you can see it from, you know exactly <laughs> what it is from this size to I'm sure huge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what and how do you how do you pick that that composition? Like, what is the things that make that composition so that you know that it'll work? Is it? Uh, you check between thumbnails and you check when it's large. Yeah, yeah, I guess <laughs> and, so. And you push pixels around until it, it looks perfect large. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously back then. I guess that's kind of the benefit of working with constraint. I only have the size of my apartment in my living room to work with. So right. I can't really build out a scene where I can really have a tableau or a model standing full length with a full environment built out, right? Because sure. I like to build things physically. Um, but obviously with my newer, new projects right now, I am trying to go a little bit bigger in terms of including environments and things like that. Right. And you just you just thumbnail and pray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's good. I think it's great. I yeah. mean, the thing is, I think you know, because you know, I've worked in visual effects for a yes. long time. Mm -hmm. I've done a bunch of CG, and a lot of people I know. And I'm a big, I'm a you know, traditionally I do a lot what's lighting. So mm -hmm. to me, that's actually photography, but in the computer, yeah. right? So yeah, lighting like, definitely plays a huge part. Yeah, lighting and color design will help read a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you, what are your tips for, for, for thinking about lighting when you're doing something in your style? Like how do you think about lighting? Uh, a flat is always good. <laughs> flat, right? <laughs> yeah, you try to go for as flat as possible and that makes uh, color grading really easy and it, it creates opportunities for details and interest. Right. Uh, I mean, I also do like high contrast lighting, you know, hard lights. I obviously use that too, but I think you definitely have to design the shot with intention from the beginning. Right. And it's not like an after the fact kind of thing, right? If you, sh if you light something with a hot light and you want to make it softer in post, they're like, because from, from our daily life, what we take in, we just subconsciously know when something feels more fake and something feels more real. Mm -hmm. Like even now I'm doing work that uh, sometimes we do have composites with 3D for projects commercially or for my personal work. Right. And some work that come back from uh, studios just, this just looks fake, you know? Sure. Like for example, there might be a beauty shot and there might be some 3D jewelry in front of it. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I use the hard light to light this and because they are trying to take into consideration like oh they should do showcase the makeup and make things look nice so they try to fade off the shadows and I'm like well it just looks fake because realistically this is not a high, how the lighting looks with this access accessory in front of the face right and things like that and I think people sometimes try try to be too safe or they they kind of just forget that our understanding of how like lights look from our daily lives like it is very ingrained right in audiences right so you just it's really just practicing with objects and just observing a lot right yeah 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 absolutely i think there's some 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 interesting you know ideas of flat lighting because you know a lot of people are talking like how to light something's like well there's this three-point lighting system right <laughs> oh, <And God>. so, <laughs> right yeah. so how do you how do you say no it's okay not to, to light something completely flat in front which they tell yeah. you never to do i mean <laughs> I mean, 3D is fantastic. I'm looking at my, at my roommate and, you know, I'm like, well, you open up Keyshot and you have, like, your global illumination and it's fucking beautiful. Right, like, right, right. It costs us a lot of money to do that in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, right? To, to, especially when you want to do it for a big set. Right. So uh, it, it really should just come from a design point of view of how you want this image to, to look like and what you, like, what are you trying to evoke, right? Right. Like, I, I, you know, three-point lighting could work for some things, but sometimes it can easily also feel very cheap because you yeah. see in almost every, every single second. production, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you punch up your highlight too high, it's like, oh, okay, this is a studio in this band of work. <laughs> like, right. You know what I mean? It just 
immediately sometimes there's just certain connotations with, with these kind of things, right? right? And that's the same thing when we go into color design, uh, fabric choices, or hair and makeup, and that, that is what makes an impression for a branding image, right? For, for a commercial brand and sure. things like that. And, and the same obviously goes for my personal work. Like what makes this feel more painterly than another image, right? You don't like the skin to look glossy. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like if you want to paint it glossy, then it's, it's not like a realistically rendered skin. Like right. the, paint, the way the paint, paint strokes would do like a highlight that's different. Maybe you have to paint it in in post. Right. So I think a lot of times people just don't really think about the really minute details and sure. in terms of finessing it out, yeah. So uh, you said you like to do a lot of things in camera or yeah. most of the things in camera. What do you do in post? How much, what do you, besides just, you know, maybe mm -hmm. some, some grading? <laughs> uh, grading is a lot. <laughs> yes, I'm not saying just some grading. But yeah, the, um, uh, going into the pixels and like making everything perfect, really. Right. Uh, for example, um, say we, we took a portrait of me now and right. you know that works as a portrait but if it's a finite image right um how the folds look on the edges of, of the clothing and if there are wrinkles taking all of the wrinkles out and keeping the ones that look like it will be kept there in a painting right. versus keeping the naturalistic wrinkles right that right. that gives a different mood so i do spend a lot of time almost painting an, an image okay. so it's i say i don't composite but I do a lot of post work, you do, right. especially for personal work. So right. there is a lot of painting in. So you details. remove wrinkles and do things like yeah, that. Yeah, I remove wrinkles. I add wrinkles. Right. Things like that sometimes. Interesting. I, I try to get it as close as possible, but yeah. Yeah, and it's not always you when you're capturing a moment. It's not always like I just need to move that wrinkle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we try, but there are certain things. Uh, just maybe the way this is sewn, you, you just simply can't steam it out when the, the arm is bent this way, right? Right, 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 right. You're limited by certain things. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's interesting because you're talking about, you know, sort of removing imperfections to create mm -hmm. something that looks less like you're thinking, is this a painting or not, right? Mm -hmm. And in yeah. CG, we put all these imperfections back in. So yes. That's, <laughs> people can actually think exactly. that, that it's real. Yes. So it's yeah. kind of finding that middle area. That yeah, you yeah, I always, yeah, <laughs> like the, the cyclical way that we all fit into each other, I find it very interesting. Like obviously I have friends who work in uh, production, like, you know, character design, costume design from movies. And they're like, right. yeah, we, we see your pictures in our mood boards, you know, all the time. Sure. And uh, I, I would look at mangaka's work, illustrator's work, and kind of reference their mood or lighting and find out that some of them straight up copy uh, fashion photos or get inspired by fashion photography. So it's too. all cyclical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But obviously, if you showed me a photo they were inspired by, I would probably have never been inspired by that photograph. You right. know, so that is so interesting in its own way, how once we take like an inspiration, you know, like, uh, it goes through like the machine that is our own style and our own execution. It becomes a completely different yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, now take us through your process of grading. And I know you said it's like a, it's a mm -hmm. lot, but like, what are your thoughts when you're when you're grading something? And how do you start? Like, how 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 much range do you have in your in your in your photo? You know, mm -hmm. obviously you want to not clip or crush your black so that you have room to play with it. So where where do you go? How do you start your photography? And then how do you? What's your thoughts on grading? Um, so I usually light and grade at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So as I'm shooting, I try to grade something that looks good and I will modify the lighting until it works for the grading. Interesting. Yeah. So I think for people whose work kind of, they are separated, they shoot and then they send it off to retoucher to right. color match something else that's, uh, that could work, but it's just always not the same thing. Right. Cause right. then the style of whatever you're doing is different. Yeah. Sure. So, so I do those two at the same time and I think I go through phases and I try to save templates of you know grading I have done on specific photo shoots but every shoot is different like the set design the models hair color skin color clothing color all these things and you just you j sometimes I will use something as a base and and modify you know the numbers and and go from there okay yeah 
Sorry, the, it's, okay. it's difficult to get like super specific. With no, that. no, yeah. no. I understand. I understand. But yeah. it's a, you know because you do absolutely have a style of obviously in the, when mm. you look at your colors and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of thinking about yeah. that things. Now, how did what is what is your use of color? Like, explain about how you think of color and and how the role it plays in addition to you know to complement the contrast and stuff that you do. I am honestly so untechnical about this really? is is purely yeah it's just purely feeling based i don't okay. think i did a good job like learning color theory in school you know okay. i'm just like sometimes i pull up like a you know a color palette board and be like oh, whatever it's too much work to, to look after this and okay. I, I just pick whatever match and go with each other um occasionally as a shortcut i will ask my friends who are much better artists it's like these two colors will work well together right, right. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Like, yeah or be like A or B, I think B works better and they'll confirm for me. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I do that, but um, most of the time, I think just try and error and you do it until you see it sure. sort of thing. You know, it's similar, a little bit similar to lighting. You have a general direction, but when you really go on a shoot, everything can be so different in, 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 your, in terms of expectation and in real life, right. what you have to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you just adapt. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's 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 great. That's mm -hmm. great. So so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, how how technology has changed in photography since you started. Mm -hmm. Like how, how what have you seen an evolution in technology? Have you do, do what has have you been able to benefit from it, or what what's how has that changed? Mm -hmm. Well, megapixels has grown a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> retouching has become more and more work. Uh, when I started, we were working with. I guess 20 megapixels files, and now it's right. like 100, right? Right. So, so you just work more. Um, but obviously, it's also nice because you have like high fidelity images for fine art prints, and that's that's great, and right. things look nice. Um, uh, well, there's AI, right? <laughs> right. Uh, even before the current like you know mid journey stable diffusion trends, uh, even the last few years, you know we get solicited by brand. Uh, like studios or companies that are doing AI model faces. So you could generate a model's face without hiring a model. You, you can use a base of anything and then they'll just generate model spaces for you. So yeah. you save on model usage fees and things like that. Uh, I never personally used it, but from a corporate point of view, I can see that saving a lot of money. Right. For, what for, are your feelings about that? Uh, so I do some art direction work for, for esports teams. Um, I used to own an esports team in StarCraft 2, mm -hmm. and I stay friends with some of my peers, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe I shouldn't say peers, they were better than me, uh, mm -hmm. in esports, and some of them are doing quite well. So the company I, I direct for right now, Team Liquid, they are one of the top teams in esports right now. Okay. And uh, we have used some AI-generated work in, in terms of just like uh, during the concept phase in working with illustrators and artists sure. for background art and things like that because in an ideal world you work perfectly with the best artists right but you can't like commercially you just as a client you can't always afford the best artist uh, if you can afford the best artist he might not have the best time for you because he's busy with something else that's more important to him right all right or if you work with a newer artist uh, one of the challenges I have is uh, 3D artists don't thumbnail the same way that 2D artists do, and it was it was a huge learning curve for me in, in getting used to that because even as a photographer, I thumbnail my work, mm -hmm. so you know just to receive a sketch in 3D of already like done thing is like I don't know how much they can change, right? And if I want a huge change, they don't want to do it, and right. like why am I stuck being like this, right? And things like that. So you know, just being able to iterate quickly and you know, doing better than a stick figure sketch as a thumbnail to provide to the artist. That's really useful. Right. Uh, so that's the, and commercially, if corporations are interested, it will definitely develop fast and quick. But obviously as a creative, um, I really like, I really liked to play Go, uh, you know, the, the Japanese yeah, yeah. Go game. So I followed the news of when AlphaGo uh, beat the best yes. uh, Korean player I've met. I used to follow the goal scene and I photographed some goal players at events and stuff. Awesome. I just have a lot of hobbies. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah so I've met that player personally. Yeah. Just one of the best players of, you know, as when I was growing up. And even at that time, I, it, it felt like a huge loss of soul as, as a player, right? Because 
the game that you felt was the most difficult in the world has been solved, mm -hmm. right? And the, the best human player can no longer beat machine. Right. And even at that time, I had been thinking and just talking to my friends, like, in a few years, you know, AI will be able to train based on our style. And I have a lot of friends in startup and in machine learning, AI, natural language processing. And it's just, it, it had been interesting conversations and it has come to be pretty close to what I had anticipated, I think. We right. defin definitely kind of need legislative help, I think, in protecting artists' rights in terms of what, you know, is being used for right. uh, data assembling, right, and training. Um, I think it could be a great tool, but inevitably it will be like photography is for portrait painters back then, you know, like sure. cars for horse-drawn carriages. Right. You will not be able to stop it. And that, and then we have to wet through this whole um, discussion about uh, people who want to be able to create art without putting in, without having put in the effort for of training it sure. in it, right? Like, and it's just, I mean, it's going to be a lot to navigate, but it will stay here and it will be used. It is. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously, I know there's a difference, yeah. but just you know, for but, reference, mm -hmm. when people use your photography as reference, mm -hmm. yeah. they are basically taking a little bit of what you've done yes. to inspire them from what yeah. they're doing. So how, you know, there obviously an AI is, you can train an AI to do yeah. exactly that, which is mm -hmm. part of what it is. But do you feel that that's the right thing to do or were all raw art as referenced in a lot of ways? <laughs> um, Ethically, obviously it's fine for people to do studies sure. as a learning process. Uh, obviously, personally, I would feel like I don't love when people, like there's the difference when someone is saying they're doing a homage or, or there's a difference between like, oh, this is my new work and they're so proud of it. And you know it's referencing your work and they took motif from something you have built. Yeah. And, I mean, that feeling sucks, right? right. But I mean, I, I will never call it out, obviously, like, good on them, you know? Sure. Like, I can't stop it. So, so in a way, self-destructively, I think like, well, essentially, the AI is doing a lot of what artists do, which I also don't like yeah. being done to me, yeah, right. you know? And obviously the, the legal copyright part, you know, there's like AI taking more sections of sampling your image versus someone else at least creating that from scratch on their end. That's, that's a separate matter from the style replication. Right, yeah. right. But it's also interesting because if you think about it, there's other AI tools that are very much helping photography that have nothing to do with duplicating your work. Mm -hmm. Things like AI denoising, mm -hmm. AI upscaling, Absolutely. things like that. And those are all based on a similar yeah. technology. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> uh, I mean, definitely we will all use it when, right. when it's necessary. Like I only, you know, retouch or post produce the way I do or like painting things or, uh, color grade manually because that, that's the way I like to do it, right? Like right. If there are probably a lot of people who are just automatically using filters and, you know, or automatically generating um, uh, s certain, like, assets or things like that. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that has already been part of our off workflow, but it's definitely something in the separate realm, I would say, from total image generation, right? Because those kind of AI are still kind of like tools. Right. Right. There's a difference between using like, um, you know, Google to do like a deep research and building your own library of a thousand images and then, you know, painting something at the end of it. Uh, right. That's, that's just based on what you ingest and what you output, right? right. Versus typing a prompt that you finessed to, to look like, I don't know, Craig Miller's work, <laughs> you right. know, right? It is, there is still a difference between that. Like, sure, there's a different craft, but it's different. Right, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. But okay, so there's another thing that, you know, when you're doing a photograph and you have a subject that you've got in your mm -hmm. photograph, you are 
giving direction to that person, right? Yeah. And so you're prompting that person in a lot of ways sure. yeah. <laughs> to do that. So mm -hmm. that person has to interpret what you're doing in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. So there yeah. is an interaction. Mm -hmm. I'm, not I'm not defending mm -hmm. AI, and, no, and, no. but I think mm -hmm. that there's just thinking about that. If that mm -hmm. technology is going to be here to stay, which mm -hmm. it will in it will. some form or another. 100%. It will. <laughs> right? <Trust me>. So, <laughs> so yeah. what do you do? What is, what, how do you give direction to someone? How do you find a way to communicate that person what you're trying to, to, to accomplish? In the oh, when I work with models? Yeah. Uh, you just communicate. I don't, I don't really think too hard. Uh, I think... You just have a very, well, I just have a very clear vision about what I might want in terms okay. of mood or angle. And I will move the camera. I don't really shoot with a tripod. I will just move the camera accordingly to find an angle and then right. like move the model a bit at a time. Sometimes I just move them physically like, okay, stay still. I'm going to move this hair. I'm going to move your hand, okay. you know, and then turn your head towards me a tiny bit more. Right. Things like that. You just, okay. uh, to me, they, they are sometimes definitely more of a mannequin than a model it depends right. on, on a professional job like a really good model will save your life because that's they just perform and you, and you get the shots that's different right. yeah so for the fine art work sometimes it's it's so specific you can just direct them to become exactly what you need right yeah. more like a mannequin like, more like a mannequin. <laughs> yeah and 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 you also need very good models for that who are very good at it, holding still or giving you the exact expressions that you want right yeah. right like yeah what makes a good model <laughs> what makes a good model uh, someone who studies the material, you know, um, I, I scout a lot of, uh, scouted a lot of inexperienced models for my personal work. And, uh, one of them, after two or three or four shoots, she came back, I was like, oh, you're holding your hands really beautifully. She's like, yeah, I've been home, I practiced based on like the artists and painters you wow. liked and like based on the kind of poses you like me to do, which is sometimes holding a small book or holding a candlestick and things like that. Wow. So, so there is there's obviously homework, like sure, I can teach them, but if they are learning on their own, they can do a much bigger breadth of possibilities nice. to, to bring to, to the set. Right. Yeah, so people who do their homework. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure it's an amazing opportunity for them to, you know, learn from you and then be able to have a result that they can use for their careers as well. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. I try. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I think it's really kind of interesting uh, to think about all that. What are your thoughts about the future Where, beyond the AI stuff that's mm -hmm. going on? What are other things that I think are going to be happening in your world? Uh... What about social media and things of that nature? Like, how has that affected your work? <laughs> I, I do not spend enough time on social media. It's, it's very, very difficult for me. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> it's just, uh, I think I just tend to over worry and over overthink. You know, I grew up in a time where like, I was popular on DeviantArt and there was so much exposure sometimes. Uh, I would see blog posts dedicated to someone talking about me being fat, uh, like compared to a previous photo, because I was doing self-portraits. And <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm not even a celebrity, <laughs> you know, I'm like behind the camera, but right. why am I subjected to this? So, so I, I try to be really careful in the things I say or, or, or not say, you know, or, right. or uh, the things I show, like it was only in the last couple of years I started posting a bit more self-portraits again. I'm like, you know, I'm older, you're gonna call me fat or ugly, like fine, that's, that's on you, <laughs> you know. Right. But, but, you know, growing up on the internet, I was like, as, you know, still a teenager, right? And then a young adult, that was, that was really difficult to read. Um, right. And um, yeah, so <laughs> this is hard being a woman. Um, yeah, and, I'm, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I have a teenage uh, daughter, and I'm I'm worried. You know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, you're making podcasts, so I assume you're tapped into like social networks and social medias yeah. and things like that. So at least you can kind of support her, educate her, and things like that. I absolutely. I think. I mean, this is the thing, right? I think that with the podcast, I can help give people information and help people guide people, and hopefully, you can help people as well. Yeah. I'm sure there's young I'm mothers trying. and young fathers as well who'd like to know what how to help their kids and yeah. what they can do. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I try to speak out once in a while sure. about certain experiences I have. Like, I don't want to do it all the time because I feel like we already have so much 
shit in just daily news cycles like yeah. it's it's so exhausting I, I just don't go online sometimes for a stretch at a time right um yeah but I, I try to speak out when i can i try to call up little behaviors that i think are you know not really correct uh, sure. here and there and usually you, you do have people who come in like you know that was so helpful to me and that was you, you helped put a word to something that i've been experiencing i felt like was hurtful but i didn't understand and but of course sometimes you still have people who say like uh oh you must be so difficult to work with like you're like must be such a bitch like you know uh, i you why don't you just like smile in your photos all the time why are you so fucking depressed you know like, i would never hire you i'm like well you probably can't afford me anyway but cool you know like just wow. they're just completely unnecessary things like it's not even about you right i'm talking about someone else uh dismissing someone's feelings and you know but yeah. there are people who would just over index on, on how like that's a personal attack to them right yeah. right but i'm so. just I, that's yeah that's very sad <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah I, I do think seeing people with a platform calling people out is is beneficial because right. that gives power to other people to feel like maybe i should consider doing it when i feel comfortable because for me i was i was definitely afraid of speaking out for so many years just from you know having experienced some backlash in the past right, right? but in more recent years when you see people speak up more and, you, yeah, you start to build up like a, no, maybe I can too. And, and that right. will help the people who are my audience who might not be seeing these other things. Yeah. yeah. And I just think it's interesting, you know, like, you know, with photography and obviously Instagram is such an important social media platform yeah. uh, or popular. I'm not going to say important. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh -huh. But I think that, you know, obviously that the inspiration of, of Instagram was photography and telling stories through photography mm. in some ways. And I think that it's interesting that that, that has become such uh, a poison in, in, to a lot of people uh, yeah. for what, they, what they're doing. So I think it's great to have photography that's a little bit more about the art and the craft mm. instead of just, you know, putting things out there to either hurt people or be hurt by putting <laughs> things out there. You know, like yeah. the comment section is terrible. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Like obviously there's so much unhealthy image and things being promoted, but at the same time, I feel like without social media, there might not have been a lot of conversations sure. and activisms that were had in the recent five, 10 years. Right which I also think were very valuable for advancing, for example, for me, the fashion community and, you right. know, in terms of like more diverse casting or um, just uh, not even just casting, just crew, you, you, you know, things like that. Sure. Yeah. So, so just. <laughs> what are the advantages that you found literally because of that knowledge and because you're a woman and finding out, you know, you know what it's, what it's like to be hurt through comments like that and having experienced that more per very personally, do you think that that influences the way that you photograph things and that you look at things? <laughs> um, and has that given you an advantage in the, in the field of photography? I don't know if it gives me an advantage, but I think I just, maybe because I never grew up idolizing fashion or photography, uh, so I feel like you just treat everybody else as another human being. Right. But it, when I first started photography, especially before now, where, you know, respect and rights are talked about a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, back then, we were, you know, I would ask the model for permission, like, hey, can I address your dress? Or uh, do you mind if we want to do like a new shot on the back? And you can say no, 100%, like absolutely sure. no pressure. And I would just have models who just look at me and they're like surprised. They're like, nobody ever asked me if they can touch me. They just expect me to drop fully naked out wow. here to change and and it's a lot for a girl and sometimes stylists will just call them fat and and just like like these are teenage girls who are like living on the shape of their bodies like like that's really difficult for them and right. i'm just like i'm not doing anything extraordinary but apparently it was just so uncommon does it, but it must feel so wonderful to them to feel treated. I, I'm, I'm more glad, respect. but yeah. it's, it's horrifying that it this is. is something so unique and special. Right. They're like, yeah, I have never done like, you know, nude or implied nude with someone else because guys just always seem like, like, like uh, they're definitely respectful, professional guys. But there are so many stories of men who take advantage of younger models, you right. know, and Oh my God, I, just, <laughs> I can't with these stories. It, it's just, it's horrifying. 
Good. Yeah. I'm so, glad you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you. I try. Yeah, and, and people were like, oh, you have so many like women or POC on your team. I'm like, I just, I just hire who comes along and who is good. I've never thought that you're supposed to be diverse. <laughs> like, like right. I, I didn't really realize it was the thing. You know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, you know, early, early, but a lot of fashion photography has very male gaze concepts yes. behind it right and then you don't you don't do that as much. <laughs> so. yeah I, I, you know like obviously sometimes i like to shoot i actually i shot for a men's magazine while i was in singapore when i was just starting out and uh -huh. um uh yeah i think a woman's perspective of what is like sexy or sensual definitely has a difference from how a guy would shoot it right. and direct it you right. know? Yeah, so. And what about, so, so I think there's, and correct me if I'm wrong this, but I believe that in France now they've made a law so you can't retouch, change faces or body distortion as much as... Maybe. I think, was it France or UK? I think could have been both, both of them tried to push for less retouching in right. advertising work. Because they completely yeah. change bodies and faces and photographs. Right? Yes, yes, that's definitely a thing. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's great. But um, in some ways, sometimes it's also, again, double-edged. Like, we have finally come to a point where a lot of younger audience realize there's retouchings and there's filter. And now you're using models that have perfect skin when they're unretouched. It, it, it creates kind of another heightened beauty standard that, right. oh my God, even without a filter, they look so bloody fucking perfect. Right. <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? You know, right. like, um, lighting can completely transform how someone looks. Yes, of course. Makeup itself can completely transform. And, and sometimes even I forget how transformative it can be. Like just from lighting and grading, right. e even pre-retouching. Like I do not look like myself in some of the self-portrait work I I've been doing, you know, and it's just, I do not look like this in real life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I it hear does, it. Does, we are selling a lot. <laughs> Right. So once in a while, I post on my Instagram to remind people that none of these are real. <laughs> right, of course, of course. Like, like, yes, I need to take a paycheck to live, and I like the artistic creativity of this, but... Right. Yeah, and, you know, because all of us doing an image like this are professionals. We are here to make something look extremely good, which you don't have in your daily life. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you do every a lot into it in, in camera in that way. So that's really nice, uh, and it, and it's really great uh, what you're doing. And you're very inspirational. You're extremely ambitious, uh, <laughs> and I really appreciate you taking some time with us to to share your stories with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It was very fun.